<clears throat> so what I'd like to do um, today is talk about a, a, a new project. Uh, and the project is entitled um, Critical Analytics. And it is a project <clears throat> that is a overall critique of social media. So, uh, um, and this is, this is pre-fake news social media. Um, uh, so this is a, a kind of generalized critique, as I said, on the one hand. And on the other hand, a, a kind of proposal for a, for a way forward. And <clears throat> I call the, the critique vanity metrics. Uh, critique and the way forward I call uh, critical analytics. So what I'm going to do um, is uh, uh, talk a little bit about the assumptions of what um, social media are for. So generally speaking, are social networking sites. So what are they for? Um, and uh, and if we um, take them to be sites where which are primarily for the presentation of self. What kind, of, um, what kind of metrics then follow? And, and what I will argue is, is we are basically being driven also in research, <clears throat> but certainly in social media by uh, vanity metrics, which we perform for. So vanity metrics are performative. So what I'm going to argue is that we should um, seek to consider other forms of engagement. So the, the original. Uh, um, title of this uh, talk um, is otherwise engaged. So I would argue that we would like to seek, or we should seek, different forms of engagement in social media and with social media. And in doing so, we can also redo the metrics. So we can also develop different kinds of metrics that drive behavior or drive engagement in uh, more productive and, and socially uh, uh, significant ways. So this is the overall argument and so it has a series of steps. Uh, so I want to take you through these steps uh, uh, now. So I just want to kick off um, by talking about um, engagement with social media uh, today. So um, most engagement with social media today is uh, sort of oxymoronically uh, forms of distraction. Uh, so we are distracted. Uh, and there have been a number of notions that have been developed to capture this idea of distraction. Uh, and these are, they were developed in the, the, the late noughts, so 2007, 2008, around this period. However, I still think that they, they capture uh, what uh, this, sort of, this sort of distracted mode of engagement um, that we are all in. And so the first one, um, it was uh, coined by Nicholas Carr, who's an American cultural techno cultural critic. <clears throat> and it related, in fact, to search engines, at least initially, uh, whereas the other two are slightly different. But uh, I think it still captures a particular uh, form of, um, of distraction. I just want to quote from, from Nicholas Carr and his idea of flickering man. Now, I mean, it sounds gendered, but I don't think he means it gendered. Um, so, um, and here's the quote uh, from Nicholas Carr. Contemplative man, the fellow who came to understand the world sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, is a goner. He's being succeeded by flickering man, the fellow who darts from link to link, conjuring the world out of continually refreshed arrays of isolate pixels. The linearity of reason is blurring into the non-linearity of impression. After five centuries of wakefulness, we're lapsing into a dream state. So what uh, Carr is doing with this notion of flickering man is he's providing arguably a kind of cognitive critique of what um, first engines and subsequently social media are doing to, uh, in some sense, our brains. So this is also quite a classic critique. Uh, it'll, it comes up again and again. But I think this notion of flickering man captures it ra rather well. The second notion that I would like to bring up um, is one that's also uh, used uh, oftentimes in computer-related design circles and elsewhere, uh, but was in this particular context uh, by Clive Thompson 
was uh, actually quite critical. And this is the notion of ambient awareness. And other people, scholars, have talked about the notion of remote intimacy. Uh, and so this is, a, this is what social media are, are, is doing to us interpersonally. So not cognitively, but interpersonally. Um, and uh, ambient awareness is the need uh, and the, actually the performance of a constant up to the minute updates on what other people are doing. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, Ito referred to it as remote intimacy. There are other notions as well uh, about, about sort of phatic communication, but then remote phatic communication. So not substantive, but connective communication that continues to drive our modes of engagement, our distra distracted modes of engagement. Now the third one, <coughs> which um, is sort of, I think, more work-related, um, uh, is, is this idea of uh, developed by Linda Stone, and this I think this is uh, this captures something quite uh, quite well, and that is continuous partial attention. So the idea, um, and this is a quote from Linda Stone, an artificial sense of constant crisis, so as to not miss anything, a new condition because it is neither synchronous nor asynchronous communication, it is semi-sync mode. So we're constantly in semi-sync mode. One eye on our phones, this relates, I think, most of all to, to telephones, uh, uh, smartphones, as does ambient awareness. One eye on our phones um, and, and, and one eye on uh, what someone is saying. Uh, and, and this particular idea of, um, of, 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 of this kind of partial attention, this, this particular idea captures uh, a, a form of, uh, like quite, I think more than the others in some sense, um, sort of a permanent state of distraction. So one is permanently, there's, um, I don't know if you know some of these figures, uh, the, sort of the number of times the average teenager, and it's not only teenagers, look at their phone per day, it's something like 5,000 times. Um. <clears throat> So, I mean, just on the interface level, um, there have been a few uh, sort of uh, ways of addressing this distraction. I just want to bring them up because I think it's important to know that work is being done uh, along these lines because uh, th that we are distracted is, is quite well known. And, um, and I think um, there are two kinds of uh, types of work being done. The one is... Um, a, a kind of playful critique, quite serious, in fact, as well. Uh, and this is uh, a couple of the examples of the work done by Benjamin Grosser, um, his uh, demetrication work. So it's it's the removal of the of the numbers uh, from from the interface. So this is the this is his Facebook demetricator, which um, which he uh, uh, came out with in 2014, and then. 2018, the Twitter demetricator. So, th so the way of removing push notifications and removing, sort of changing the interface so that it does not distract, or at least does not distract as much, and it does not sort of invite our labor uh, and our work for it. Uh, the other one is a kind of a movement that's gone back, that goes back a, a few decades. Uh, and this is the encalming en technology movement. Now, if you're an uh, Apple user, you'll know that when you have your computer open, your notifications come in slowly upper right. Now, this is directly from this encalming en technology. Uh, so on the one hand, um, it's, it's trying to alert you without distracting you. Um, so <clears throat> now, uh, the, orig the origins of this were done by, uh, were put into place by um, uh, John C. Lee Brown and Wisner, and, and they were working at Xerox, Xerox Park at the time. And I just want to uh, give you a quotation uh, by them as to why the encalming technology movement. Information technology is more often the enemy of calm. Pagers, cell phones, news services, the World Wide Web, email, TV, and radio bombard us frenetically. See how dated it is. 
However, now these are dialog boxes, pop-up boxes, push notifications, alarms, updates. So, so these are um, what is what is now uh, uh, grabbing our attention, and, and then the calming technology movement um, is 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 a is a one way of uh, of, a, of of addressing this situation on the interface. Um, but what I want to do now, instead of talk about kind of solutions, I want to develop a broader critique of uh, what, uh, what social media um, is, uh, is, is assumed to be, what the purpose of it is now, um, and, and in some ways uh, how to critique it and how to move uh, forward uh, from, from this, to move beyond that particular critique. So, what I'd like to argue um, is that social media is assumed to be for um, a couple of things. Uh, so, so one thing um, is that it's assumed to be for social networking. So we're supposed to network uh, on uh, social media. Um, and uh, when one networks on social media, there are a couple of sort of outcomes that the platforms would like to have achieved. Um, and these outcomes have been sort of critiqued in a variety of ways. So one um, is what uh, Jenna Wortham has called success theater. The idea of performing uh, as if you are successful in social media. So showing uh, one's successes. Uh, uh, sort of boastful media. Now, now we have not necessarily, I mean, this is this front stage performance uh, idea that Goffman talked about, um, uh, but it, it, it also um, leads to particular kind of metrics which I want to come to in a minute, which I call vanity metrics. And, but the success theater is in some sense um, performance of vanity. So being pleased with your achievements and showing them to others. Uh, so this is the first sort of uh, critique. The second one is uh, a productive networking. So we are in social media, um, we are asked in some sense to continually network. And these networks are assumed to be, or at least there is a, a debate about uh, whether they should be uh, sort of productive. So, um, it, was, it was Dana Boyd um, and her colleague uh, who had a, one of the early critiques of the notion of social networking sites and made a distinction between social network sites, this is a classic, and social networking sites. And, she, and they argued that they should be social network sites, so sort of reflecting and edifying your existing network, and not the sort of neoliberal, here it comes, social networking sites where you're supposed to be productive in the network and turn your friends and acquaintances into some sort of uh, productive relationship, whether it's co-modified or not. So this is the second critique. The third one <coughs> is that within these networks, um, and now this goes back um, some time to the idea of, of um, what, what Alan Liu wrote about the laws, the laws of the cool and where the cool is, where the cool is happening. Uh, previously this was the web, um, now it is a social network. So in social networks, in social media, there are um, uh, interesting activities, uh, products, uh, trends that are worth following. And there are some who know about those trends um, and they then push them, so the influencers. So it's also the site, social media, and, and this is the idea of, of again, the pro pro productivity of social media, uh, of a site of consumer futurism. Uh, uh, so you will consume, uh, or the future of consumption is to be located in this, in this space. Um, so, uh, Arguably, on top of this, this set of set of this this performative uh, idea of social media, uh, there are also metrics, uh, and this is where it gets even more interesting. I would say, um, 
So, so the metrics, and, and we've talked about them before in terms of those little numbers, whether they're on your phone or whether they're on the interface of, of, your, of your social media platform, they ask you to do something. They ask you to work, work for the, work for the platform. Um, but they also do something else. Um, they show um, how well you're doing in some ways. Um, but, but it's not only how well you're doing, but it's particular measurements of how well you're doing. And I want to get into those. And, uh, and arguably, um, what we're seeing increasingly in social media, uh, certainly, I mean, I, don't, I think Noah would, would argue about Instagram, but it's also in the other platforms as well. It's just, uh, there's this sort of ce this, this celebration of celebrity. Uh, there are new terms. Uh, that are coined, the micro-celebrity. Um, so it's interesting to re recall um, one of the most interesting critiques of celebrity was by um, Daniel Borston, the former uh, US Librarian of Congress, who wrote in 19, published in 1961 the book The Image. Um, and he critiqued celebrity as, as the, the quality of being well known for being well known. And he contrasted celebrity with greatness uh, and, and made a critical distinction between the two. One is a well-knownness. Uh, one, one is famous for being famous, whereas uh, one, is, one can be famous for being great or for having greatness. And those are quite different. Uh, we celebrate uh, in social media uh, the well-knownness side of it, arguably. Uh, secondly, What's interesting um, is the rise and the ease with which we all have embraced the, the notion of the influencer, also in research, uh, uh, kind of unproblematically. Um, so there are influencers, uh, and they're interesting to study. Um, now, what is, what is influence? Influence is, of course, a, a network measure, right? Um, so in social networking, in the, in the networks, you can measure uh, uh, influence. This is sort of degree uh, centrality or in degree. So it's, it's, it's um, like how in between one, between the centrality, sorry, between the centrality, how between we are. Um, and, uh, and, and it's the optimization of, of in-betweenness or strategic in-betweenness that, uh, that is ultimately influence. So we can measure uh, these sorts of things. The third one, kind of along the lines of metrics um, and how we're currently measuring how well we're presenting ourselves um, in, in distracted modes of engagement, is the notion of trending. Uh, and and the, 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 um, the rise of the word trend as a verb, to trend. Um, so, so trending, uh, of course, became well known with, with Twitter's trending topics. Uh, but um, it has, as I mentioned before, um, it's about, in some sense, the idea that in social media, uh, one, a, a, a sort of profession that one has, uh, sort of amongst social media community managers and, and, and the rest, um, is, is the idea of cool hunting. So one is looking for the cool, um, and that which, which then would, would trend. Um, so, I mean, I define trending as rising relative novelty, but it needs also to be cool. Uh, and and this, is, this is the idea of, of measuring, of thinking of the value of, of social media as um, largely as being able to measure um, celebrity influence uh, as well as, as, as the trending. And I, I, th I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I sort of bring up Baudrillard also in this respect of this idea of seeing these, these numbers and seeing how well you're doing as a, as a form of kind of statistical uh, wish fulfillment. Um, so what I'd like to argue um, is it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and I would like to introduce an alternative way of thinking about social media, on the one hand, and an alternative way of, of thinking about 
uh, measuring activity and engagement on the other. Uh, and this is, I'm calling uh, this practice critical analytics as an as a alternative uh, to vanity metrics. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how to shift the attention from uh, vanity um, to, uh, to critical analytics. And I do that uh, by arguing that we as scholars and we as activists and we as uh, individuals in, in this world um, could also consider social media not solely or even primarily as a site for the presentation of self, but rather as a site for both the enactment as well as the study of social causes. Uh, and I think that when we, sh when we begin to think about it just briefly, uh, I th we're all very well aware, and the e examples that uh, Jana has showed us uh, from various movements that have been studied, I think that, that, it, um, that, it's, that it's quite well known uh, that social media also um, is a site uh, of uh, struggle uh, and, is, and, a, and a site worthy of the study of uh, social causes. And I would like to argue that uh, as scholars, um, these platforms as objects of study arguably have shifted uh, in the direction of that I'm talking about. Um, so this is the argument that the next part of the, the, the talk is this the argument that I'm going to make. I'm going to argue that scholarship has, has shifted, not completely, uh, but, uh, but in part from studying these platforms as principally platforms for the presentation of self to platforms for uh, the mobilization and engagement in, uh, in uh, social causes. And I, I'd like to argue that this has taken place in a variety of uh, uh, platforms. Um, and I want to start um, there. So Twitter, I think, I think Twitter, um, I think we're quite a long way away from Twitter as, the, as an object of study for um, the, the, the sort of ambient friend following. Um, so this was the original Twitter. This was Jack Dorsey's Twitter. Uh, and this was what some people uh, panned as the what I had for lunch medium. Uh, so, 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 you know, tweeting about my ham and cheese sandwich uh, and, and with, with people, um, you know, critiquing that, the first reaction to the um, uh, donation of, of, of Twitter's archive to the Library of Congress, the first comment that, that someone put on the blog entry was, oh, now I get to know what flavor of burrito someone had for lunch. Right? So, so the, so, but I think, I think this, this Twitter, um, the, 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 when the slogan was, what are you doing, um, uh, this Twitter, and this is um, the original, or one of the original sketches, Jack Dorsey's. This is still on Flickr, at least it was when I looked uh, fairly recently. So, uh, so you see what, what Twitter was, was for here. Twitter was, the, was for sort of the young San Franciscan urbanites. Um, it was a domain hack stat.us status for status updates. And the default settings for the young, young urbanites where you either were in bed or going to the park. I, I like, those are the two defaults. Um, so I think the, the, this particular idea of Twitter um, uh, changed quite abruptly, arguably, in uh, June uh, 2009 uh, when Twitter um, suddenly was not what I had for lunch but was the uh, sort of prompt or at least associated with revolution. So Twitter becomes sort of like kind of overnight as a sort of revolutionary medium. It's interesting because Dorsey and I mean, this is around the time when he was outed as CEO before he returned later. But he argued that, that Twitter was actually quite good, good at uh, elections, disasters, um, things like this, sort of events. 
Uh, and one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the ways of studying Twitter that I've put forward and developed techniques for is for remote event analysis. But nevertheless, um, Twitter uh, became something uh, quite, uh, quite serious. And I, I just want to, before I go to Facebook, I just want to mention um, that most recently, um, Twitter has become a generic data set. I mean, I think that most people here, um, when, when you say, well, uh, so we're, we're, we're going to study social media data and we're, we're going to study uh, the societal via online data, and then you say, and here's a Twitter data set, everyone's like, okay, okay, it's Twitter again. Um, so so there's t the idea of, of Twitter um, as, as, th as the go-to data set for whatever uh, one wants to study societally is also beginning to be, or is quite critiqued, um, pr predicting elections, uh, predicting celebrity awards, uh, uh, etc. But nevertheless, what I'm talking about is, this, is Twitter 2, um, this is a paper, uh, a summary of a paper I wrote called Twitter 1, Twitter 2, Twitter 3, um, which I can tell you more about if you're interested. I think something similar has happened with Facebook. Uh, and, and I think the reasons are different. Uh, I, I, it's not because, well, they are in part uh, similar, uh, but in part different. I think Facebook started off um, as um, a presentation of self, medium in some sense. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Social Network. Uh, this is Sean Parker, uh, one of the early uh, figures in, this, uh, in, uh, in Facebook. Um, uh, so uh, so the, the, the personal info, I mean, in this particular um, uh, rendition of Facebook, you're sort of looking for people. Right? So, so it has this kind of, kind of, this sort of dating uh, vibe to it. But if you look up YouTube, by the way, if you go to the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive and you look up the first screen capture of YouTube, it was the same. It was a sort of, kind of dating-esque uh, site. And in, in any case, so the, this is the, the presentation of self. Um, Facebook was, in a, in a number of, for a number of reasons, um, uh, became the object of a kind of ethical crisis. Uh, and this was largely because of this study um, uh, that, was, that came out um, in 2008 by um, Harvard University uh, researchers who took a, a Facebook data set. Um, and this is very early API. So it wasn't extreme. If you, if you read carefully this study, um, it seems as if they scraped the site, uh, but they did so with permission. So this is, it's a bit of a kind of interesting area of exactly how they got the data. But nevertheless, they anonymized a set of profile data, did analysis of classic social network analysis concerning tastes and ties, looking the extent to which connections lead or uh, are uh, associated with um, kind of click behavior or the similar, similar preferences. Um, and subsequently, researchers at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee look, took the data set and pulled out some comments, searched Google, and actually was able to, to uh, de-anonymize. Um, so so, so uh, to studying profiles and studying Facebook as, as, uh, as a social network for the study of tastes and ties um, came, uh, became quite tricky. Around that time as well, Facebook, now famously because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and everyone's now going back into the history of face, uh, Facebook's API, around that time changed the API. So you could no longer um, get the data of your friends. Uh, so you were once able to map your network. Um, and, and your friends, also, you could also get your friends' tastes, if you will, profile items. Um, but that changed uh, after, uh, it wasn't directly related to this ethics case, although it's not clear if it was not 
com not, was completely un uh, un uh, unconnected. Nevertheless, because of this ethics case on the one hand and because of the change in the API on the other hand, arguably a lot of work shifted from the study of the self and friends um, to the study of pages and causes. And of course, this is probably the most famous page of the Egyptian revolution of 2011. We are all uh, Khaled Said. And so we had the, the Twitter revolutions, uh, Moldova, uh, uh, Iran, um, etc. And then they were followed in some sense by the Facebook revolution. So we, so we have these the, the, the revolutionary uh, social media platforms once again as now the study of causes. Um, Jana showed a little bit of this work, um, what one then can do with the study of pages and the, st and the study of pages as the study of causes is begin to um, look at pages. Uh, and when one does page analysis, uh, one can do a number of different things, but one of the things one can do is to look at interliked pages. So pages can like other pages and you can find networks of liked pages around particular causes. So this is, um, this is sort of the new right in Europe, sort of right-wing extremist interliked pages, for example. And I just want to warn you, the next slide, some of the images aren't pleasant. But the other thing you can do is you can study engagement within these networks of causes. Um, and so you can study uh, the most engaged with images, uh, the most engaged with uh, posts, the most engaged with content. And what you often find increasingly is that these are memes. And these are memes across uh, whichever cause. Uh, so, so the meme uh, as a format um, is, uh, is uh, and as additive, I mean, I'm not just talking about image macros, I'm talking about a meme as sort of additive content. Um, that, that leads to sort of additive comprehension of a of particular stance taking. Um, so this is the kind of study that one, one does uh, with, uh, with now uh, pages and causes. Um, I should mention um, that, um, that, that we're still finding memes. Uh, however, there's a new era, uh, obviously, of Facebook studies. Um, and that is the, um, the fake news influ influence campaigning era, which we can spend some time talking about if you like. <clears throat> it's a kind of different lecture, if you will. Uh, but what's interesting about this is, is the pressure on Facebook to close the Pages API. So you may or may not know that for whoever is running um, academic software that is connected to the Pages API, that we all, uh, were asked to reapply for approval of, of the software by Facebook, and we all did not receive approval. So all of the software, from NetViz to FacePager to others, um, uh, Netlytics, all of the software is now in limbo. It works, and sometimes the functionality mysteriously doesn't work for a day or two, but then it works again. Um, and and Facebook is now replacing this with the Social Science One initiative, which, since I'm on camera, um, uh, I won't be overly critical of, but it is, uh, an, uh, arguably, at least to me, uh, an, an effort to change the kinds of data that researchers uh, um, have access to. And similarly, um, in, in a way, change the type of research from the possibility of, of quite small scale, uh, studying uh, a series of pages, uh, doing interlike page analysis, and doing engagement of posts, um, to requiring kind of a kind of a big data infrastructure. So it has also a different. It's a kind of Facebook is, is is sort of going along with the kind of high end computational turn, if you will, in this social science one. Um, okay, I want to. I want to talk about Instagram just briefly. Um, <clears throat> I think Instagram um, is, has the reputation uh, or has had the reputation of being the, the selfie medium or the selfie uh, 
uh, platform. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, the, um, this is the first, this is Kevin Systrom's first uh, Instagram uh, post. Um, it's his girlfriend's uh, foot and their dog. So it's a kind of family selfie in a way. And, and, uh, and Instagram for quite some time was associated with sort of the presentation of self or, or literally self, selfie culture, which led to a number of studies. And this is probably the most well-known one. This is by Lev Manovich and colleagues, Selfie City, uh, which um, uh, took 3,200 selfies in five different cities through a hashtag selfie and geo uh, coordinate query, and then, uh, and then performed formal analysis of the selfies. Um, in some sense, ultimately coming up with sort of like city mood or city sentiment analysis. So, so uh, he found that um, uh, that the that Latin American um, cities uh, were far more joyful and youthful, uh, and Moscow was kind of dark and sad. Uh, uh, now. What I'm concentrating on um, is this period here uh, with the rise of, and we had some questions about that uh, earlier, the rise of hashtag publics or, and the study thereof. Uh, this, is, this is the object of study. Eh? It's not the platform itself. It's, it's the platform as object of study. With the rise of the study of, uh, of, of hashtag publics and in particular antagonistic hashtags um, and I mean, more recently, of course, we've had, I think scholarship has shifted on Instagram. If you went to the Instagram conference in Middlesex uh, last year, um, you will have seen 80% uh, of the scholarship on a sort of the aspirational luxury and, and influencer work critical. Um, one of the terms which I like is this idea of venture labor. Um, but I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the antagonistic hashtag space for the study of social causes on Instagram. Um, the idea uh, that there are, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a hashtag um, and there's a counter hashtag. Uh, so this is what I mean by antagonistic hashtags. Um, so it's uh, Black Lives Matter, it's All Lives Matter, it's Blue Lives Matter. It's interesting, I don't know if you've read the essay in the sort of intellectual um, journal, The New Inquiry, on how Blue Lives Matter has, has gone from a hashtag um, to uh, actual legislation in three or four states in the US protecting blue lives as a, as a separate category for, for uh, hate crimes. Which is which is remarkable. So, if you now are with me in the proposition that uh, social media platforms have, as objects of study, shifted from being those primarily for the presentation of self to being about other things, including about social causes, then perhaps we can rethink the metrics. And this is what the critical analytics project uh, then is about. So there's, an, there's another small move in this argument um, that in order to think about studying uh, these networks uh, for social causes and developing metrics to do so, um, one has to, has to rethink the network under study. And this comes maybe a little bit to what Jana was talking about, although it's, it's, it's uh, adjacent to, the, to her argument. And this is that we don't necessarily need to think of social media as principally social networks, and then thereby undertake social network analysis. But rather, we can think of them in a couple of other ways. Um, now, one is quite obvious. We can think of them as big data, right? Um, and, 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 and the various analytical procedures and questions uh, that, uh, that come with that idea. However, I want to uh, put forward a third way. And this third way is to think of 
um, these networks more as issue networks. Um, now, I think this is easy, easier to imagine on Twitter, uh, but I think you can imagine these on uh, other um, uh, uh, platforms as well. If you take the step of saying that they're, no, they're not social networks only, but they're also another type of network, then we can proceed to do a different analytics project. Um, these are kind of an alt metrics for social, for alt metrics for issue networks in social media. Uh, so this is the idea. Um, so what I would like to put forward, and, and I'll be as brief as possible, uh, but what I'd like to put forward is at least five uh, uh, critical analytics, sort of critical metrics. Now, I'm not alone in uh, putting forward alternative metrics. Um, and if you start looking around the literature, you'll suddenly, from this uh, vantage point, you'll discover quite a lot of work in this area. I mean, I've been, been reading, a, a, so uh, Dean Freelon, for example, you might know his, his scholarship, he has taken um, Charles Tilley's uh, definition of social movement power and operationalized it in new metrics. So Charles Tilly calls social movement power, uh, I don't know if there's an acronym, WUNC, it's W-U-N-C. So what's power, what, uh, what, where does power, the power of a social, net, uh, social movement derive from? Worthiness, unity, numbers, commitment. And so what Freelon has done is he's developed metrics for precisely that. Similarly, David Karp has come out with a book in two, uh, 2018 um, called Activist, uh, what is it called? Activist Analytics, something like this. Similarly, looking at how Greenpeace, other NGOs are, um, are developing metrics and analytics that, that are, come from largely media monitoring, but still are, are repurposed uh, for studying of uh, the causes. It could be the effectiveness of messaging, but nevertheless, it's about uh, the study of social causes in, uh, and the resonance thereof in social media. But I would like to get a little bit more abstra abstract, um, uh, more, a bit more conceptual, um, and talk about things that I think we all still um, under, uh, like grasp as, as um, kind of political, not political science, but sort of political, pol political and politicized uh, concepts that we can metricize. And, and so I want to talk about these uh, dominant voice, and I want to put these forward as a, kind of, as, a, as a kind of critical analytics approach. Dominant voice, concern, commitment, positioning, and alignment. Uh, and so I'd like to talk about each of these uh, very briefly. So what's dominant voice and where does it come from? So uh, when, you, when, you, when you think of the notion of dominant voice, I think what probably jumps to mind is Foucault as a Foucauldian uh, idea. Um, and Foucault uh, wrote about the cutting down of speaking subjects, um, so, th so the marginalization of, uh, of, of voice through the dominant voice. Um, and I think that this is uh, quite measurable uh, in, in social media. Um, and I want to remind you that we're measuring these in authoritative spaces. We're measuring these in issue networks. We're not measuring them in big data, and we're not measuring them in social networks, though you could. Uh, but I think the power of critical analytics lies in the type of network under study. Um, and so here, um, uh, this is an example. Um, it's not from social media, but nevertheless. This is, this is um, uh, from US newspapers, and which, and this is normalized statistics, so which uh, section of the newspaper um, uh, are articles appearing on HIV vaccine? And this is from 2011. And you see business. Uh, and health. Uh, so, so what's the dominant voice uh, in this in this particular uh, issue space? So, so, so these things are kind of eminently uh, measurable. The second one is concern. Um, and um, this I take from Latour. 
uh, although I mean, Latour has theorized matters of concern um, as from a, a, that's a kind of different sort of science studies discourse uh, where he contrasts uh, matters of fact uh, with matters of concern. But nevertheless, he does define concern uh, in passing as the redirection of attention uh, by publics. The redirection of attention by publics. The, what I do in order to operationalize this is I talk about um, uh, actor presence or absence in a particular issue space. Who's there and who's not there? Um, so it's the question here is to whom and to whom is it not a matter of concern. And I just want to show you an example from, from Fukushima. Um, and uh, this was uh, um, a query exercise, a query design that we did looking at uh, the extent to which different types of NGOs were concerned about Fukushima. Uh, and I queried uh, um, environmental NGOs, and I queried species NGOs. And what we found uh, was that the environmental NGOs, so Greenpeace, etc., uh, was ver were very concerned, and the species NGOs, WWF, were not. Now, here, we, the, when one is being critical, uh, what is also critical of who is in that space and who's not in that space, perhaps who normatively should be in that space. The third one is commitment. Um, commitment was also a part of Charles Tilly um, as in, in the social movement power, although I'm not thinking of this in terms of movements. I'm thinking of this uh, more in terms of, the, uh, of concern over time. Um, and, the, uh, and the, the kind of theoretical idea behind this comes from Suleiman uh, and his distinction between um, the concerns of a citizen and the concerns of a consumer. And how um, citizens have a sort of, have, uh, have or, or should have, more enduring care uh, for whatever, for the community, as he writes, whereas the consumer um, has uh, short-term care for oneself. And, the, and the, the idea also, you can think of this in terms of critiquing NGOs, critiquing um, uh, any kind of professional activity. Does one jump to the new trend, to the new funding source, to the new, or does one's concern persist? Uh, do, does one show? Uh, commitment and what what I um, uh, uh, would like to to give you an example of and and I, I took Greenpeace on purpose because Greenpeace is oftentimes critiqued for for um, uh, performing media stunts so so doing direct action to be filmed to get on the news um, and jumping thereby from concern to concern however. When we analyzed this, um, we found that Greenpeace uh, remarkably campaigns for the same issues year in and year out. So we took the campaigning behavior, you can do this for other organizations or baskets of organizations. We took um, the, the, web, the websites uh, of Greenpeace in this case, also for other organizations from the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive looked at their campaigning behavior to normally on a single web page and simply counted. Um, so do they continue to campaign year in and year out for the same things? Do they show commitment or do they jump around? Uh, and it's interesting that, that there are a few things that they came in and out of, uh, but, but largely um, the other thing that was interesting was, um, you, so you know Greenpeace uh, has two issues embedded in it, green, peace. Uh, and, um, and even though, and this was, this was funny, that even though the disarmament side of Greenpeace and the number of direct actions um, in the South Pacific against French nuclear testing, and you know, where Greenpeace got its origins, even though it seemed as if attention there had waned, no, they still campaign for both the green and the peace. 
Uh, the fourth one, uh, nearly wrapping up, is positioning. Um, and this is, uh, this comes from, this is a kind of, and for those of you who, who later on today follow the tutorial on query design, I'll get into this uh, more in depth. But this is about um, the purposive choice of keywords or issue language, perhaps frames, but I don't mean frames. Um, we can talk about that. But anyway, the purpose of use or deployment of keywords or issue language, and this comes from Latour, Bruno Latour, Madeleine Akrish, uh, their notion of program and anti-program. Um, and the fact that one uses language to join a program or to join a counter or anti-program. Um, and I want to give you an example, which I'll also uh, talk about. Um, this is from um, just after the US Supreme Court decision uh, in favor of same-sex marriage, where on Instagram and elsewhere, uh, immediately the hashtag circulated love wins, uh, where upon uh, the counter program hashtag was launched, uh, love loses, as well as Jesus wins. Uh, so this is the antagonistic hashtag studies, if you will. Um, what does one do with antagonistic hashtags? Well, one can study um, scope, so, uh, so how large of these, and then within that scope, look at, for example, filter activism, um, the extent to which particular filters are being used. Here's the pride one, um, whereas here's the, the Jesus wins one, which is incidentally much, much smaller. Um, <clears throat> And one can do this sort of the, the density study uh, where one looks into where these uh, hashtags are being used um, geographically and indeed <coughs> geolocate hate. Uh, so one uh, can see that the particular um, anti program is much, much smaller and much uh, very specifically located than the other. The last one. Uh, is alignment, um, and alignment um, I uh, call, um, and this is following um, Firth's famous uh, study in 1957, oh, I should put that up there, is the company a keyword keeps. So this idea um, that, uh, that there are groups uh, joining the program and groups joining the anti-program, and they are, through their use of language, in alignment with one another, which can be measured. <clears throat> the conceptual idea of this comes from Walter Lippmann, the American journalist, analyst, um, who was interested in um, having a coarse understanding or a coarse reading of bias in society. Um, and he was, uh, and we developed a Lipmanian device as a tool to, to try to provide a coarse detection, rough, rough detection of uh, bias. Uh, and he was interested in, uh, in being able to show, in being able to sort of pick out signs of where sympathy lies, signs. And these signs arguably are keyword alignments. Um, and I'll give you an example which um, these, this is, these are the various terms used for the wall or the barrier separating Israel and the Palestinian territories uh, and, and these are country names um, so you see particular countries cluster around this is separation wall uh, this is the wall this is the official Israeli term the security fence not too many countries cluster around there. So, it's, so these show alignments, however temporary. Uh, the company uh, keywords keep. This is from the UN Security Council. I'll talk about more about this later today. OK. I just want to summarize really briefly, because uh, there are a lot of steps uh, in this argument. So, so the first one uh, was that we are um, in a time of distraction in social media. Um, this distraction is being addressed 
uh, through critical projects like demetricators, also in calming technology movements on the interface level. But this distracted mode of engagement is also um, a part of a metrics project, uh, which some people have critically called, and I've also critically called, vanity metrics. And vanity metrics um, can be uh, critiqued um, as a sort of the overall outcome of assumptions about what social media platforms are for. Um, if you think of them as for um, uh, presentation of self, if you think of them as for productive networking, etc. Um, so what I've argued is instead of seeing um, social media platforms as sites for the presentation of self, one can also see them as the sites for uh, struggle um, and sites for the uh, mobilization, engagement, but also the study of social causes. And in doing so, we can change the metrics. And we can make the metrics also performative in different ways if they are critical. And what I've tried to put forward is a series of critical analytics which don't, I don't know, don't nudge, so to speak, but put on display uh, one's, uh, one's engagement um, in ways, uh, arguably, that are, uh, that are critical. Um, I just want to uh, point out that this argument um, now, uh, I've published this, uh, it's here um, in the International Journal of Communication, but it's also going to be a part of a larger project um, and this larger project um, also will uh, include other metrics uh, for uh, also these other sort of new phases. Um, so I've recently tried to develop, and this is a note to co to something completely different, but I've also tried to develop campaign detection metrics for sort of disinformation campaigns and credibility metrics for in the heightened post-truth climate, how can we still believe if we do believe? Um, this sort of fake or junk content online. So a series of metrics, alternative metrics, uh, to begin to deal with different um, understandings of social media and certainly social media as uh, different objects uh, of study, contemporary objects of study. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>